Ian Bogost, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so you got a great book out it's called Play Anything, The Pleasures of Limits, The Uses of Boredom, and The Secret of Games. And really is one of the best books I've read this year. Because you, you hit on a lot oh, of awesome. you hit on a lot of topics and ideas that I've sort of felt and sort of couldn't articulate about our modern day. So I love it. But before we get into the book, let's talk about your background because I think it'll uh, help listeners get an idea of where you're coming from. And also your background is just really dang interesting. <laughs> you're a philosopher, professor of media studies, and a video game designer, which is two things you don't see paired together every day. So how did that happen? How did you, be, you know, become a philosopher slash video game designer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's actually not as weird as it sounds, but it, I, I admit it does sound very strange. Um, and it's not as weird as it sounds because actually there's a long history of philosophers um, who worked in other media, you know, as, as, as artists and creators, uh, especially as novelists, as playwrights, you know, Sartre, Rousseau, Nietzsche, uh, uh, Duchamp, Marcel Duchamp, who's more, more well known as an, as an artist, um, eventually became a, a master chess player uh, later in life. So sometimes it goes the other way too, which isn't necessarily to like associate myself with, with folks of that level of prestige, prestige, but just to sort of suggest that there's this, there is this long history of, of philosophy and, and art intersecting. And often it's because, you know, in, in, in games or in novels or in painting or in chess, even, you know, you see, um, you see aspects of, of the abstract world, which is what we, what we think about when we think about philosophical philosophy and philosophical questions, they become, they become concretized. And that's one way of, of, of bringing those worlds, uh, uh, together, but as far as, as me myself, I mean, my background is not necessarily um, that of, of of this sort of this sort of two universes that never meet. But the question of like what what does technology have to do with with arts and culture, and how do those how do those worlds converge? It's kind of always been the the, the interest for me since I was a since I was a kid, even. Uh, and games are a particularly interesting kind of of technology, kind of computer technology, uh, precisely because uh, they were some of the first the sort of the first elements where computation became cultural. You know, uh, entertainment became a place where we tried to do something other than work uh, with with machines, and that's always been uh, been interesting to me. Um, but also, like games um, offer this kind of like. Um, this kind of way of getting underneath some of the assumptions that we that we make. They're these interesting p philosophical playgrounds. They they kind of offer the, this this strange, skewed, weird view of everyday life. You know, like you take a a field and you add a ball and some lines to it, and that transforms it into into a soccer pitch into something totally different. Or, or you take some you know some cubes that are spotted with dots and you hurl them onto a, a green felt. And that becomes something entirely different. Uh, this trial for chance and and wagers, um, or or even you know you stick four squares together in different patterns and make them fall on a screen, and that becomes Tetris. So, so games are like this um, this this place where we trick ourselves into seeing and then working with things that we'd we'd otherwise overlook. Uh, and games certainly aren't the only way to do that. But as I've sort of moved through my my career as a as a philosopher and a game designer, it's become clear that that's one of the features of games that's most that's most interesting and kind of most relevant to both domains. Right. So I mean, your your focus in philosophy is it games? Sort of like I mean, it's like Wittgenstein, right? Like wrote about games, right? If I if I remember from my philosophy, uh, Wittgenstein mind. had uh, used games as an example of of uh, a, a particular problem with language uh, right. because there's this 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 challenge with with uh, with the word games, so we don't really know what it refers to. And games were a, an excellent uh, example of a, a concept Wittgenstein called family resemblance. You know, what 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 different games have in common is not that they're all instances of some superordinate uh, category, but that they share these sort of overlapping features. Donuts are another example of that, by the way. It's sort of like what makes what makes a donut a donut is that it comes in the donut box, more or less. <laughs> uh, but my interest in philosophy is, I mean, you know, it's related to, to games when it is, but it's actually much higher level and a bit broader. The, the area of philosophy that's of particular interest to me is called metaphysics. And uh, metaphysics is a field that addresses the fundamental nature of, of being. So uh, metaphysicians ask questions like, what does it mean for something to exist in the first place? And 
what kinds of things exist and what's the relationship between the things that do at some fundamental level, at a level that that is uh, that sits before even a, a, a science, before we begin engaging with how we might manipulate and understand the material world. Uh, and one of the problems in uh, in in this discipline in metaphysics that I work on, which which ends up being a, a theme of the book, and I should clarify that you don't need to know anything about. Uh, philosophy to, to get it in the book. Uh, one of those themes is that people tend to think of themselves as being at the center of existence. And, and this is true even like centuries after the Copernican revolution, even when we know that the universe is enormous and we're this tiny corner of it. Still, nevertheless, in, in philosophy and, and even in, in science, we tend to worry most about the relationship between people and other things between ourselves or our communities and, and, and the rest of the world. Uh, and that makes sense because we're, we're in our bodies and in our neighborhoods and, and, and in our countries and so forth. But in doing that, we, we tend to overlook all of the equally interesting and, and kind of powerfully weird stuff that happens in between other stuff, even the stuff that we humans have, have made. So there's this, this kind of infinite mystery in, in every toaster and on every freeway and in every big box store uh, and those problems at a philosophical level uh, are, are of great interest to me. And there's, there's some of the motivations for exploring uh, the themes in the book. Right. Well, we'll get into uh, that idea that we're the sort of the center of the universe, how that kind of can lead us astray. Um, but how has your your f- philosophy career influenced your game design? It's done so in a, in a number of ways. Uh, so when I started working on uh, on games uh, professionally, which is about twenty years ago, sort of at the rise of uh, uh, of the internet, and some of the games that that I worked on at that time that I had the opportunity to work on um, were very different than uh, than than ordinary games. Uh, it, the The internet made it possible to distribute stuff uh, uh, directly, and you know, without kind of the, the publishing apparatus that we were used to um, in uh, in store bought materials. And I, I happened to be working in advertising uh, at the time, so I, I got involved in the, sort of the early days of of applying games to to marketing and advertising. And, and this was, you know, interesting enough uh, at the time. But one of the questions I began asking myself then was, well. Um, you know, I mean, what other kinds of purposes could games be put to? You know, this this is a kind of business use of an entertainment medium that we tend to associate with kids, or we certainly don't associate with with utility. Uh, and we, you know, there'd been a long history of games as educational tools by that time. You know, everyone probably played uh, uh, Oregon Trail or oh, yeah. other games uh, like that in the uh, in the eighties and nineties, uh, and that was one one possible use. Uh, and I began thinking about the relationships between those kinds of uses and wondering what others uh, there might be. So I began working very extensively in uh, games about uh, kind of social issues and, and politics. Uh, at my studio, we made the first uh, official uh, presidential campaign game uh, for, for Howard Dean, and in two thousand three, we worked on on games about all sorts of strange issues you wouldn't think of seeing in games like uh, uh, tort reform and uh, uh, errand running and uh, 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 you know educational policy. And we made some games about like uh, airport security and the time uh, when all of the TSA stuff was happening. Um, and the sort of philosophical motivation for some of those questions was, you know, the field of, of rhetoric, the, the philosophical domain of rhetoric. Uh, how do you express ideas? How do you persuade people? How do you change their opinions? Uh, and games are different from speech or from writing or from images in that in a game, you can model something about the world. You can kind of like make this little miniature copy of it that you can work with, that you can manipulate. And in so doing, uh, at least this is my contention as a, as a philosopher, as much as as a game designer, uh, in manipulating that little model of the world, you could experience something about like what it what it might be like to live in a version of the world if those ideas had been implemented. So it's kind of like a natural uh, a natural way of thinking about uh, uh, you know experimenting with, with with social policy or with public policy or with uh, with just ways of behaving and living um, that are different uh, from our own. Now, now, admittedly, like you know, this use of games is still somewhat marginalized or hasn't hasn't become. A, Predominant in in the commercial sphere, uh, but it's uh, it's a good example of uh, of one of the the kind of underlying uses of games that, that like sits under the radar and, and yet nevertheless is taking place every day. Awesome, and we'll talk about your game. I think we can talk about Cow Clicker because I thought that was or click the cow or whatever. Maybe we yeah, talk about that later on. Yeah, we, we can definitely talk. I mean, cow clicker is sort of the, the, my, my, uh, my, uh, my great infamy. So it's, it's always worth, <laughs> worth bringing up. All right. So let's talk about play anything, um, where you take insights from your career as a philosopher and game designer to make what, when I was reading it, I was thinking as I was reading, it, like, this is a really countercultural case, um, on how to make our modern enemy filled lives more meaningful. 
Um, but before we get to the prescription, let's talk about the cultural and philosophical problems you're trying to address, trying to address in the book. Um, so start off like what, and you mentioned it earlier, uh, I think, but I mean, what are the underlying philosophical paradigms of our feelings of angst and frustration and restlessness that we have? A lot of people experience these days. Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest, uh, uh, problems of modern life, I think, is that we we live in this time of enormous surplus, enormous plenty. Uh, we have more than we ever have had before. We can get access to almost anything uh, immediately. Uh, information is, uh, is 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 so enormously uh, uh, accessible uh, that it costs nothing uh, to access it. Uh, but in spite of all this, we we still kind of feel miserable, and we feel miserable um, more and more. Um, and maybe even more intensely miserable, kind of the more uh, surplus, the more plenty we seem to acquire. And, and this is kind of a paradox. You know, how is it that we ended up in a situation where uh, provided all of the all of the material wealth, uh, relatively speaking, especially in the West, right? Um, plenty that, that we have access to, that nevertheless, we still feel like our lives are getting worse, uh, worse and worse. And, you know, there have been attempts to Ask questions about this problem uh, before. Uh, one of the uh, one of the the figures that I talk about a little bit in the book is the psychologist uh, Barry Schwartz, who uh, who wrote this book called The Paradox of Choice. Oh, you know, maybe a dozen years ago, and you know, one of his insights was that uh, you know the, the 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 when you have all these choices, then in theory you should uh, be more gratified because you have uh, so many options. You have options for spouses and options for shampoo and mustard alike. Uh, but the the problem actually is that the more options we have, then the more a bad choice becomes kind of kind of your fault, and you internalize that sense of of, of despair and of uh, of regret for having made what turned out to be a, a bad choice. Uh, and it was really only a bad choice because you felt like you had other choices. Um, and you know, if you kind of extend that to the the contemporary world. That condition hasn't gotten any better. In fact, it's only gotten worse. Uh, and online life has kind of amplified that, you know. Uh, in addition to uh, infinite shampoos or mustards at the at the store, now we have access to kind of almost anything. It's immediately accessible with almost no switching cost. And so, and so we go through this anxiety of of all of the options we have, all of the missed opportunities or the potential missed opportunities that we face. Uh, almost constantly. You know, it's, it's the kind of thing that makes you hold off until the very last minute uh, to make plans with people because you're just not sure if something better might come along. That's like we do that with everything. Uh, and in spite of all this, we seem at the same time to believe that a relatively small and maybe increasingly smaller uh, number of things and people and activities uh, could provide us with the contentment that we that we supposedly that we supposedly savor. Um, and I think fundamentally this this problem, it comes down to the idea of freedom, of our interpretation of what it would mean to to be free. You know, we're, we're obsessed with this this idea of freedom, but we think it means escape. You know, I, if only I could kind of do what I want, then I'd be content. I need I just need to to, to rest myself out of this this moil of stuff that I have to do that I don't want to do. And then on the other side of it, I'll find the things that, uh, uh, that can provide me pleasure once I overcome the supposed nuisances or obstacles uh, uh, that are in the way. Uh, but then once we do so, those things that were supposedly going to bring us pleasure only become additional nuisances and obstacles. And so that becomes this sort of endless chain of misery. And that's the problem uh, that, that we have to, we have to overcome, and and to overcome it, as you know, as seems obvious once you start looking at the problem directly, we'd have to find a way of of finding not just not just contentment or satisfaction, but but joy and delight in all of those things that we previously characterized as as nuisances. You know, all of the the shopping trips and the and the commuting and the uh, and the and the lawn mowing and the ordinary stuff of daily life. Right. And I mean, and I guess, as you mentioned earlier, too, all these choices and all these things, like it puts us in the center of the universe, right? It, we live inside of our heads. And when reality doesn't match the ideal in our head, like we get frustrated. Yeah, which it never does, because the world is outside our head, actually. And, you know, the the, the sense of entitlement that we have, uh, you know, not not in the sense that, oh, I think I deserve a certain kind of a job or a certain kind of partner, uh, but rather just the sense that we are 
uh, owed some some debt by the universe, and that it should respond to us uh, in a in a way that gives us gratification. Uh, you know, this is this is a starting point of a whole set of anxieties, and uh, and this is also where where anger and misery and, and even violence come from. Uh, but then to respond to that through negativity, through nihilism, to say, oh well, you know, the universe is fundamentally unconcerned, and therefore nothing matters. That that can't be the answer. That can't be the answer either. Uh, it's understandable why we sometimes despair in that way, but we know we know exactly where that leads, and it doesn't lead anywhere good. So, in in the face of the knowledge that we are um, that we live in this sort of you know secular age where we can't seek singular meaning outside of ourselves, uh, in, whether it's in God or even in just culture, because because culture is so multivarious now, um, then we need a way for all of those individual encounters with ordinary objects, ordinary things, ordinary people, to bear meaning without that meaning having to be like produced from within us, without us having to invent it all the time. Right. So it's kind of going against, like, that's, like, it sounds sort of like you're going against existentialism a bit. Like, that's the one thing I, I find existentialism attractive. But then I'm think when you think about it, I was like, God, that's a lot of pressure. I got to like come up with meaning for my life. That's hard. It, it's, it's too much pressure. No, nobody, can, nobody can do it. Um, and if you try, you can do it for a little while and then you become overwhelmed uh, with, the, with the burden. And, and the, 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 the funny thing about this, this solution, which is, I mean, wh- wh- one, of the, one of the people I talk about pretty extensively in the book is the, the, the writer David Foster Wallace. And, and you know, this is, this is one of the solutions that, that Wallace uh, uh, suggests that, uh, you know, if we can kind of um, uh, uh, trick ourselves into thinking that, uh, you know, other people have it kind of might have it worse off than I do to kind of flip the flip the bit on our sense of uh, of despair or of uh, uh, of disorientation then this is one way of, uh, of of attaching ourselves to something to something larger and and you know like this is just a an impossible um, idea it's I mean it's it's nice to think about and certainly there are moments in your life when you can calm yourself down or you can kind of you know resist ratcheting up a conflict or something by by imagining that the you know, the person in front of you at the supermarket line is taking a long time, you know, ha- has some some difficult challenge they're facing in their in their lives and you should just chill out. But that's just doomed to failure as a matter of course. It's just a huge, enormous burden. Uh, and even despite um, the, the the temptation maybe to, to, to pursue that kind of logic, like, why would we even have to? Like, why, why make up stories about the world uh, as you might imagine it to be uh, when instead you could look at the world and see how much it has to offer uh, for you to work with, uh, and this requires, you know, a kind of different, a different way of looking and then responding to the things we find around us uh, every day, uh, which is which is really the the fundamental idea in the book that you can play anything, and you know, I, what I mean by that is that anything whatsoever can become a, a source of of delight and pleasure if you work with it uh, and treat it for what it is. Right. And yeah. That's I thought it was an interesting argument you made with. David Foster Wallace, because um, I've yeah that that whole idea of like flipping the switch came from that essay that speech. This is water, um, right? Yeah, it was it was a, a, a commencement address at Kenyon College, right. right? And but I mean, it sounds great, but the, you're right though, because like what it does is you're you're just basically living reality in your head again. Like you you have to create this reality in your head. That might not even exist. Oh, right. And, you know, and then, like, what are you supposed to do? Kind of come up with the worst case scenario for every situation so that you make sure that you are kind of, you know, deferring your own needs and desires to the worst possible response that someone else might have to it. You know, it, be, it becomes this kind of like this like rat race for for worst case uh, scenarios. And so even even the burden itself becomes its own burden, as you imagine, like even worse and worse and worse explanations for for why other people or other situations are, are behaving in a way that you can't respond to. When you could be focusing all that energy and just actually working with the world, doing things with uh, with the materials uh, that are given to you. But but of course, it, it requires like uh, retraining ourselves um, uh, not, not just you know in order that we don't get annoyed with the with the slow driver in front of us or something, which is you know where Wallace's examples mostly live, but like with the act of driving itself, or the act of shopping itself, or the act of you know uh, cleaning up the leaves that are that are that are falling from the trees, all, all of that stuff that we think of as chaff, you know, it has to become meat. It has to, there has to be some way that that we can that we can um, we can learn to attend. Uh, to those opportunities and treat them as opportunities rather than as seeing them as these these things that then we'd have to invent stories about in order that we could tolerate being around them. Right. So you you make the case that one response that we've 
um, gone to in our modern day to to, to handle this I don't know, existential pressure, this uh, angst of so much choice and FOMO is irony. Um, irony carries a lot of hip social cachet today. Everyone's trying to be ironic and be meta. And I'll admit that, like I sometimes do, I, I'll do that. And but I I I hate myself after I do it. I'm like, why? Oh, it's so dumb. Um, so. Let's start off. What? How do you describe irony? Because I think Alanis Morissette might have steered people <laughs> in the wrong direction. Yeah, what I irony mean, is you know, in its in its in its kind of uh, original meaning, I- irony in, in its kind of literary sense is is uh, language that says the opposite of uh, of what it means. Uh, but it's actually become something slightly different, and um, and now what irony means is saying or doing something in a way that prevents others from knowing if you even meant to mean it or not to mean it, you know? Yeah. Um, so like when you, when you wear the, the, the trucker cap or, or drink PBR or, you know, post a, an Instagram of, of some strange flavor of, uh, of potato chips that you found or whatever it is that you do, right. Uh, riding the fixie bike, all of these sort of, these sort of silly tropes of, of hipster irony. Um, it's not so much that they are treating things as these kind of fetishes. It's rather that you can't tell, you can never tell uh, whether you or anyone else uh, means to mean that they are attached and interested in those things or that they mean to spurn them and scorn them and kind of sneer at them. So it's that like undecidability, that 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 uh, uh, uncertainty of knowing uh, whether something is sincere or contemptuous that that characterizes a contemporary irony. And you know, it, it's it's no surprise that we found ourselves uh, in in this situation uh, because we have just all of this all of this stuff, all of this this surplus of of ideas and things and information and and, and, and encounters. Uh, and in in the face of that of that surplus, right. Uh, we're still not able to to find uh, pleasure and delight in our lives. Uh, we have all of the things that we could possibly want, and yet, you know, and yet we still find them, we still find them wanting. And so, you know, we recognize that kind of under the surface that uh, that there's this this inconsistency. And one response to it is to kind of hold things at this distance. You know, they they threaten us that things might go awry. I'm not sure if you know if that new that new IPA is going to be pleasurable or not. So I'll just you know I'll just kind of talk about what a silly name it has on the internet. Um, and some of the some of that anxiety, that ironic anxiety, does come from real social uh, uh, concern. Uh, and you know, I think we're, we're living in this 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 time of uh, of austerity, even as we are also living in a time of great surplus. Uh, and I think the rise of irony, you know, with the with the rise of the internet, also corresponds with uh, uh, with austerity and with the the kind of economic collapse of the post two thousand eight uh, 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 Great Recession, and all of these things that we once were able to take for granted, at least to some extent, uh, many of those have fallen away. And so our fear is is somewhat founded. Our fear that that things might kind of kind of you know bite us in the brain for having thought about them. Uh, there are reasons why uh, there are good reasons why that that anxiety exists, but we've extended that anxiety to kind of everything, everything whatsoever through this this ironic distance, this detachment from things. So the irony allows us to hedge our bets, right? Like it's a hedge, yeah. It yeah. allows you to hedge your bets. You know, I might or might not come back to this and treat it for what it is, and then of course, uh, by by doing so, we ensure that we never will. Right, right. And how does and how does the internet um, rocket boost this sense of irony that we we have that in our culture. Yeah, almost almost everything we do online is is ironic to some extent. Some of it is more ironic than others. So any meme or sort of, you know, uh, 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 image uh, that you see online can very quickly enter that 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 ironic uh, that ironic mode, you know, someone uh, someone photoshops uh, an image of something in order to turn it into something else or you know, you've got infinite numbers of like uh, a Trump or Hillary photos after the debates that then get, you know, turned into uh, 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 their own memes that then get turned into, f- into f- still further memes. And then people screenshot the tweets or the Facebook posts of other people saying things uh, that they find ridiculous or absurd and transform those into these, you know, all of these like layers upon layers upon layers of, of reconsumption and distancing. Um, 
and you know the the pop cultural uh, uh, version of this is is also quite common. Um, you know the, uh, the the tendency that we have to talk about talking about things. Oh, there, you know, there, here's here's a, a television show or a, you know or a, or a video game or, or whatever it is, and uh, and it can always produce these sort of these sort of images or gifs or what have you um, uh, that allow you to kind of take a portion of it and 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 use it as a joke or a gag that appears to be engaging deeply with the material, but also distances. Um, that actually distances you from from you know really treating it for for what it is, and and you know through that exercise of like meme making and and, and internet trips and so forth, uh, we've also ironized kind of ourself and our relationship to others just as much. And, and you don't even know anymore. Like someone someone says something to you online, um, and you know there's the old joke about on the internet nobody knows you're a dog, uh, but in fact you don't know that you don't know that someone's a dog or not. You're not a urine register. Maybe they're a dog. Maybe they're not. Um, you can't take something seriously because it might be in jest, or, or even if it was serious, then the the you know your interlocutor might say, "Oh no, no, I was just kidding. You misunderstood me." So we live in this this kind of this kind of vat where where online where we're we're never really sure what's happening or why. Uh, and part of it is because we don't know anything about many of the folks that we encounter in this sort of an anonymity of online life. Uh, but also, even when we start to, there's just a whole barrage, another wave of new material comes pouring out uh, as our as our screens scroll through the through the new content on on Facebook or Instagram or what have you. Uh, so the internet is, has just amplified that that existing sense of uh, of irony that was that was already present and. Um, and because we spend so much of our lives online, you know, we have to do work and you have to do, uh, you have to interact with your friends and your family online. You, no, it's impossible to avoid. You just can't avoid it anymore. Right, right. And, and yeah, when I was reading that, it made me think of the, the Three Wolves t-shirt, Howling at the Moon. That was a great example from a few years ago. So I think a lot of people like, I think that a lot of people actually liked the t-shirt, but like they couldn't say they liked the t-shirt because that wouldn't be cool. So they hedged their bets by saying, well, I'm wearing this thing, but isn't it funny? Ha ha! All right, it was a good example. Yeah, that 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 sort of you know it was it was ironic to wear it, but then it was ironic to talk about not wearing it, or maybe you were wearing it, maybe you just photoshopped it onto yourself, so you didn't really have to wear it. Um, and I think the T-shirt is one of the prime examples because it's so easy to make a T-shirt now that you find T-shirts for everything. It, it used to be actually quite difficult to get something onto a T-shirt. You know, it was time and expense. You have to silk screen it. Um, but we have all these services that we can use, which, which you know, so we have all like, like infrastructure, this infrastructure for irony that we can tap into. Uh, and I'm I'm just as guilty of this, uh, you know, as anybody. Uh, it's so tempting and so easy to do. Someone makes a quip online, and you take a screen. I did this just the other week. Like, you know, someone said something, and I. I took the screenshot and put it on a on a T-shirt that you could get on one of those on-demand printing services. You know, it's it's, it's so easy to do that uh, that then and then of course you know the, the person I was talking to went and bought the T-shirt and took a picture. And, and on, on the one hand, there's there's this opportunity to kind of engage with the conversation that we're having, but on the other hand, uh, it's 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 easier just to kind of hold it at this distance or to kind of kind of cover it in plastic, like, uh, you know, like your grandma's sofa in order that you don't have to engage with it. And instead you can talk about the idea of engaging with it instead. Right. And it's, I mean, it's a solution that we've gone to, to sort of deal with this, this infinite choice <clears throat> that we have, but well, it works in the short term. It always works in the short term because you can kind of go, ha ha, look what I did. You know, look how I made a, look how I made a joke out about, about the world. And then everyone laughs and you get a bunch of likes or retweets or whatever it is you're looking for. And then, you know, five minutes pass and, and it doesn't make you any happier or more content. You just have to find another source of that material. It's almost, almost like the, the logic of addiction. Right, right. So it does, it's not a long-term solution. It's not a long-term solution. And then it's not even a short-term solution in the sense that you're not taking delight in the joy of the, the Three Wolves shirt either, right? You're, 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 you're neither uh, building a, a kind of platform through which you could, you could develop a long-term interest and meaning in something, nor are you developing a method by which you could... Um, you could get pleasure in these, these, you know, these all these random individual things that are constantly scrolling by us. Right, right. And how do most folks um, combat this irony? And why does like the way they usually approach it or try to combat it fail? So, uh, you know, the, the, there's this this term I coined in the in the book, ironoia, which is is sort of like paranoia for things, right? So, if paranoia is the mistrust of people, then ironoia is the is the mistrust of of things and that that act of distancing of sort of holding things at arm's length you know and uh, and saying okay well you know that there's something but i'm going to just wait and see if see if something better comes along or or perhaps i mistrust that it might it might be 
of use or of interest to me. Um, that maneuver is like half right. And the, and the half of it that's right is in, in, in like stopping, you know, stopping your ordinary life and your ordinary attention and noting that there's something before you in the universe, right? Like, okay, here's this, here's this shirt or here's this person or here's this problem or here's, you know, here's the, this task that I have to do, whatever it is. Um, and then, and then kind of, kind of uh, circumscribing it, you know, saying, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to draw a circle around this so that I can focus on it. But, but then the ironic maneuver, what it does is says, okay, I've, you know, I've, I've captured it, you know, I've, I've sealed it inside of this bubble, like plastic wrap, like I'm going to put it on the shelf and now I can dispose of it. You know, I've, 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 I've successfully captured whatever that thing is in the world. Uh, and, and I've, I've caught it. It's not going to be a further, uh, it's not going to do me further harm. And I'll just I'll just dispose of it as quickly as possible and move on to the next thing. Um, so the half that's right, you know, the, the kind of approach that's right is is in recognizing things as they exist, but then instead of instead of uh, casting them aside, you know, waiting for the next thing to come along, you want to take that thing and begin to work with it to manipulate it, okay, to so, figure out what you can do with it. All right. So let's talk about uh, and, that's, let's talk about yeah. that. So I mean, your solution to that is you you play with it, right? You play uh, with it, right? But um, I think most people the way most people define play. It's not exactly how, I mean, it's not exactly how you define play. Um, so how do you define play? Or what do you mean by play? Cause yeah, m- most of the time when we hear play, we, we think it's like the opposite of work. You know, play is what you get to do after you're done with what you have to do. Uh, play is this, uh, this experience of, uh, of freedom or of being unfettered, you know, not, not being kind of held down by obligation or duty. Um, and instead, I would suggest thinking of play not as the opposite of work, but as as this thing that exists in materials. So one when, when, um, when good analogy for this that we actually talk about as play is the, the play that's present in a mechanism, you know, like a, a steering column. There's a, there's a little bit of play in the, in the, in the mechanism before it engages and begins, and begins turning the wheel. Um, or if you think about other, uh, other domains in which we, that we use the word play in, uh, uh, for like uh, instruments, we play instruments. You play the guitar. You play the piano. It's not that you're like doing whatever you want with the guitar or the piano. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. When you play the guitar, um, you're you're taking its its material properties, the the strings and the fretboard uh, and and the body of it, and you're holding it in a certain way, and you're and, and you're uh, and you're manipulating it to produce the sounds uh, that it's capable of. And and through that manipulation, you can produce uh, music. That's what it means to play. Uh, so if you take that kind of analogy of 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 the way that you play the guitar and you apply it to anything else, anything whatsoever, and then play is a process of of uh, evaluating, understanding, and then responding to the, the the material properties of things. So seeing what you can do with them, how you can incorporate them uh, into your experience, and and how you can treat them uh, based on the the constraints and limitations that they present to you rather than kind of seeing them as uh, as these potential tools through which to achieve your own desires, as if you even knew what you wanted. Right. So it was kind of take a step back here. So like um, going back, well, so we, we play in playgrounds. Like you make this analogy of playgrounds and playgrounds are sort of these areas. Like we'll talk about like a typical playground to see the park. It's an area where you engage in play, but you say you can create playgrounds anywhere. Like a playground would be the musical instrument, right? Like you have this, they have these strings, they have frets, they have this board and you have to, that's the playground. You have this constraint that you have to deal with. And then by dealing with that constraint, you can actually create something pretty cool. Right. And if you, if you were to sort of reject it, if you say, well, this is preposterous, look at this, this, this idiotic object that someone claims I can, I can play music with, you know, obviously I can't like I, I, and, and this is what happens when you pick up something like a guitar for the first time or a piano or a, or a set of golf clubs is they're hard. And they resist you because they don't, they're not that concerned about your pleasure, uh, the pleasure you derive from using them. Uh, and, and in order to make good on them, you know, you have to, you have to engage with it. You have to take it seriously for a while. Okay, like, like, how do I learn to play the guitar? What do I need to know about it? What have other people done before me? How does it actually operate? Uh, and then over time, you can, you can develop this relationship with it. Um, and, you know, some people would say, well, you know, that's a guitar, but you can, you can't possibly do that with, you know, errands or commuting or, or, or what have you. Um, but I think that's, that's absolutely false. You can do it with anything. The trick is in, is in delivering, bringing that, that, um, that deep attention and commitment to it in the first place, uh, which is where the, the idea of the playground, you know, is useful. You see kids do this all the time. Kids are just like so good at, at, at finding play in, in anything, um, and you can think of the playground as like a, a physical enclosure, like like you see in the park, but it's also a conceptual one. 
You know, like if, if you if you send your kids outside, you're like go play outside, and and they'll run outside, and then you know very quickly kind of say, okay, what's here? Oh, there's some sticks. What are these sticks? Oh, let's make up some rules about what the sticks are for, or what they do, and then taking into account like the material properties of the stick as a thing that could be a sword or that you know you could throw or what have you, um, and that sort of activity is is possible with anything. It just requires you know being willing uh, and and um, and open. Uh, to seeing it for what it is and asking how you can manipulate it, how you can play it. Right. So, I mean, so it sounds like what people do with irony, they, they make the playground, right? They like kind of take this object, they see it and they put a boundary around it, but then they just, like you said, stop. throw it away. They stop there. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, the, the first maneuver uh, that ends up being an ironic one is to, to, you know, to take something and kind of remove it from the world to draw this, this, this playground or the circumscription around it to say, huh, Here's the thing. Here's the thing before me. That thing could, you know, I'm worried about it. It couldn't, it couldn't possibly produce the pleasure it promises or that it doesn't promise. Let's just talk about the idea that it might, and then let's dispose of it. Uh, but if you, if you engage with it really deeply, uh, if you sort of accept that invitation to enter that sphere and take it seriously, um, then you find uh, just impossible depth. Um, you know, one of one of the examples I have in the book is the uh, the uh, the McDonald's filet o fish sandwich, which uh, is is a favorite of mine. And uh, there was this uh, there was this uh, story a number of years ago about like how to make your own filet o fish sandwich at home. It's a great example of of a a moment online that could go toward irony or could go toward play. And you know, the the, the kind of ironizing move is to is to do this in order that you can kind of laugh at the the, the low quality food at McDonald's or that you can take a picture of it, haha, I made a, a filet of fish at home, or, or that you can kind of uh, suspend a, 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 this uh, uh, this uh, this sense of whether you mean to sort of exalt or to or to scorn uh, the sandwich by talking about it or making it in your own kitchen. Uh, but the truth is that it's actually super interesting to understand uh, how industrial food is made and where it comes from and how you might recreate it um, in your own kitchen. And, and by engaging with it in that in that in that serious way, even something as preposterous as a, a fast food sandwich, um, you've you've discovered something new about the world. And that discovery of uh, of novelty is is where the contentment comes from. From if you allow it to, uh, if you allow it to percolate, you quoted this one. I think it was philosopher anthropologist where he makes uh, the, he makes the case that play is actually the driving force of human human culture. Yeah, if you, I mean, if you think of play in this very general way, that you know, play is the process of, of 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 encircling something and then manipulating the contents that are within it. Then all we're really doing uh, when we when we produce culture is is playing. It's just that it's not it's not play as this this kind of uh, uh, release, or or, um, uh, or or as the opposite of work or of duty, it's play as the the serious and deliberate manipulation uh, of the materials that we that we find. And and you know when you think about some of the examples, this this is a, a, a Dutch anthropologist named Johan Hoitzinger, and uh, and one of the examples that Hoitzinger uses is the uh, the court, the courtroom. You know, so the courts are a stage of play, and they actually have something uh, very much in common with. Uh, with the theater in some sense. This was one of the reasons why we like to watch courtroom uh, dramas on television. In fact, uh, we, we kind of have, have individuals, uh, the judge and the, and, and the jury and the, and the attorneys and so forth who are playing roles and they are, they are speaking and using uh, the, the rules of law in a way that's different from the way that we ordinarily use, use language and performance uh, in day-to-day -day life. And, and through that manipulation, of legal code of uh, of rhetoric of performance, uh, they create a very real outcomes. Right? This is this is uh, this is a, a serious context, um, and you don't necessarily need a serious context like that to understand how play produces uh, culture. Rather, to understand that that when you see play as this process of of manipulating what you find, rather than this process of escaping the world into into the the, the dreams in your own head. Uh, then you're always being productive uh, when you do it. You're always being productive when you uh, when you perform it. Right. So uh, it's interesting. You brought the, the the courtroom. There's these roles. These these defined you know words you're supposed to say. So there's constraints, which makes it awesome, right? Like we don't like as you said, most people think of play as like oh you just do whatever you want, but you say in order for play to be actually fun, we'll talk about what fun means. There has to be constraints. And I thought it was interesting. You argue in the book that the way we often go about trying to find, improve our lives is through restraints. Can you talk about the difference between restraints and constraints and why constraints are the better way to go? Yeah. Uh, 
so we're we're obsessed with with asceticism uh, suddenly, right? Like, uh, and it's it's one of the responses to this this world of of plenty uh, that we live in, right? Oh, you know, I shouldn't, I should that, or I should, I should really exercise more. Um, you know, I want to do this thing, but I'm going to try to resist uh, doing it because it's it would be better for me to do this other thing. You know, those are these sort of negative and potentially ironizing moves that uh, that that the logic of restraint uh, demands that we perform. Um, and if you kind of flip that on its head and you instead accept the the natural sorts of constraint that are built into the things that we find, which are sometimes exactly the same things, right? Like it's not that I'm going to resist eating cake. It's that, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, if I'm interested in a certain kind of diet, then I'm going to stock my pantry and kitchen uh, with the kinds of foods I want to eat. Let me figure out how I'm going to go and find those uh, and, and purchase them in a way that puts the right stuff around me such that when I, when I go to eat thing, I'm eating the things I want, right? Or, um, the active constraint that you uh, that you accept when you um, when you when you enter the sphere of a game, right? The the pitch or the or, or the playground. If you find yourself on the football or the soccer field, and you say, "Well, you know, I just refuse to accept the rules of the game," then you're not playing. Uh, but by accepting those constraints, you're able to enter into the experience of sport. And if you if you stop yourself as you you watch a soccer or a football game and you go, "This is ridiculous! Like, what, what are these people doing? They could do anything they want. Um, you know, why why are they adhering to the rules of the game? It doesn't make any sense. This is what makes the game what it is. Uh, so by by looking for accepting and even inventing and applying new constraints uh, to our lives, we can we can flip this 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 ironizing uh, tendency to try to restrain ourselves. Like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to have that second glass of wine, or you know, I I, I really shouldn't do this. Into uh, into a, a a method of structuring our behavior around the limitations that we've either deliberately set up or that we've accepted. Uh, in the world that we find, you know, wh- one example of a set of constraints um, is the the constraints of uh, of uh, of the people and uh, uh, and and things that we find in our in our daily lives, right? The the actual properties of our family or our, our significant others, the the actual properties of our of our homes or our jobs, um, and we we complain about those things all the time, right? Oh, if only. You know, if only my wife or my husband didn't do this thing, then things would be better in my marriage. Or, you know, if only uh, if only my my uh, uh, my job weren't so miserable, then I wouldn't hate going to it. And you know, even despite those sensations, you can always kind of flip them on their head and, and figure out, okay, well, like, what are the properties of those circumstances? What are the what are the limitations and constraints that I can work within? What can I do in these situations rather than and then how can I uh, obsess over what is impossible? Right. So, yeah, accept the world as it is and work with it. Deal with it. Anyway. Right. And, you know, of course, there's a point, there's a point at which, you know, accepting the world becomes absurd or, 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 or unpalatable or, or even destructive. So it's, it's, it's not kind of like a fatalistic suggestion that we, you know, just take everything that already exists, that's all that there can be. We can always alter that world too. But we have the sense that, um, that we kind of have to dispose of things much more rapidly than we really need to. And, and we, and so we fail to, to accept and to, uh, uh, to evaluate, to find the, the constraints that are present and to work within them. And instead, we kind of move immediately to rejection. Uh, and, and, you know, because there's so many other options now, there's so many other options for everything. Oh, you don't like, you know, that beer or that shampoo, there's another one. You didn't like this uh, this potential significant other, no problem. You know, just just swipe and find another one. Um, that we've kind of enculturated ourselves to that to that notion of rejection rather than than admitting the opportunity to stop and say, okay, like, I'm going to treat this for what it is for a minute, see if there's anything more that I can find. And then inevitably, inevitably there is. There's always these hidden depths and things uh, once you allow yourself to discover them. The other problem with restraint is that it's exhausting. It's like existentialism. It's like trying to come up with meaning, like restraining yourself all the time just exhaust you and it ends up failing in the long run. And how many things can you reject before you're you're out of things? And then you've got to find new things which you then have been in the habit of rejecting and so you reject them too. And, and you know changing that attitude uh, from from restraint to constraint is is difficult but we have these models for it. And, and you know games and play are one of the are one of the places we can look for those models. They are places where we um, a game is a place where you accept the the arbitrary absurdity of the world, and instead of rejecting it, you say, "Okay, like I'm going to take it for what it is and mess around with it." And that's what play is. Uh, and if we can bring that same attitude to to ordinary life, not just to entertainment or not just to sport or not just to the places where we normally think of play as taking place, um, then we can apply that same that same ad- that same attitude, that same strategy for seeking pleasure to to ordinary things as much as extraordinary ones. Right. So the you talk about in the book the result of play is fun. Like usually we we put the two together. Well, it's not play if you're not having fun. If you're not having fun, well, I'm going to stop doing this thing because it's not 
playful. Um, but fun is a word that gets thrown around quite a bit, and we kind of use it just sort of as this filler, just to describe things, even though we don't really mean it was fun, it was just sort of interesting. Um, so how do most people use fun, and how do you define fun? Fun is one of these amazing words that means almost nothing. If you stop yourself the next time you find yourself saying fun or you hear someone saying something was fun and kind of ask, well, what am I saying? What, what do they mean? You'll quickly realize, I actually, I'm not sure. You know, we, we have this intuitive sense that fun means pleasure, that, 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 that fun is a kind of uh, synonym uh, for pleasure. Something was pleasurable, something was fun, and that's what we desire most is to, is to have fun, to, to gain pleasure from things. Uh, but in fact, many of the, many of the experiences uh, that we describe as fun they tend to be actually quite difficult, even even kind of miserable. You know, they, the the you you come back in from a a, a, a long run or a uh, or, or, a, or a difficult uh, uh, day at the office, um, and uh, you know you've you've taken some gratification in the work that you've done. It was harrowing, but nevertheless, it was it was positive. Something something pleasurable uh, emerged from it, and so that like that like idea of fun is this sort of lightweight, um, uh, easy pleasure. It just turns out to be to be totally wrong, um, and if you kind of kind of dig under it, what you find instead is that you know fun is like a placeholder for naming a process of discovering something new in something familiar. Fun is that 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 process of discovery of of novelty, um, and 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 the reason it's such a lightweight or um, or or thrown around placeholder term is because we you know we we tend not to be able to see and discover those those moments especially when they occur in ordinary um, in ordinary life when they're not part of something remarkable you know you go out for for an evening or like after dinner drinks or whatever or you're you're, you're hanging out with some friends or some coworkers or whatever and you get back home and uh, and your roommate or your spouse or whatever says you know how was it you ever, oh yeah i had fun it's like what you really mean by that is that you know you've you found yourself in a situation that was the same one that you did last week that you've done a million times, um, but there was still something new. Or there's still something to learn about your friends, or there's you know there's still something interesting to be had in commiserating about uh, about life at the office, uh, or there's still something interesting and novel uh, uh, to discover about this the, you know the exact same uh, path that you take on your on your uh, on your jog or on your on your bicycle route. Um, and that's what fun is. It's uh, it's the discovery of novelty, and especially the discovery of novelty. In the kind of the kind of uh, you know uh, almost almost sickening context of familiarity, when you can dig through and under familiarity and still find something new, that's where fun comes from. Right. So it's like taking a look at the playgrounds in our lives, the conceptual and the real ones, and then playing in them, and then finding new things in the playground that you didn't see before. Which which demands repetition, right? I mean, this is one of the features of games is that they're very repetitive. You go back again and again. You do the same things over and over and over again, rather than trying them once and then kind of, you know, testing whether they're worthwhile and asking, okay, well, if so, I'll continue. If not, I'll give, I'll give it up because there's something else I could pursue instead. So that, that need to return to something, uh, is part of it, it's intrinsic to play and it's also required, uh, for fun, for fun to emerge. Uh, it's very, very easy now not to, uh, not to bother trying something a second time or to kind of go back and go deeper. But there are many things that we can't resist trying a second time. Like you're going to have to empty the dishwasher tomorrow, just like you did today, and you're going to have to drive to work tomorrow, like you did today, and you're going to have to balance your checkbook and do your taxes. All of this stuff that we construe as miserable, we still have to do. We have to do it every day. Um, and if we can dig under that that familiarity and and through play find novelty in those experiences, then they can be just as fun. Uh, as the supposedly delightful uh, 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 activities that we pursue in order uh, to to seek pleasure. That's awesome. So the so part of the subtitle of your book is the pleasures of boredom. Why? I mean, we often think that boredom is terrible. Like that's like that's how people get into trouble. Boredom is what leads to people to the bottle, to porn, to all these sort of distractions to distract them from the boredom. But you argue boredom is a good thing. Why is boredom a good thing? Boredom is a sign. It's a signal. It's like a flare that goes up that says, okay, you know, now you're ready to start. Uh, when you find yourself bored, you've, you've kind of expended all the obvious choices. You know, you've, you've, you've done the easy things. Uh, 
and now the work can start in really determining what's you know what's in a situation, what something what something means. So you know one of the places that you might find yourself aboard is at work, or you know in your car, or you know you've got to go out and do do errands, or you you know uh, you find the, one of the examples I use in the book is the the long haul flight, you know, at fourteen hours on a plane, and you know you start and you you kind of do all the things that aren't being on a plane. You watch watch the movies, and you eat the food, and you read a book, and you listen to music, and you play some games, and you do all this stuff that's meant to distract you from the experience of being of being stuck in this metal tube five miles above earth hurtling through space at, at, at uh, 500 miles an hour and then once once you kind of get over that once you've done all the things that are not being in a plane just by being in a plane um, then you're faced with its reality and that's terrifying it's one of the reasons why when we when we when we feel bored and we also feel anxiety I don't I don't know who I am I don't know what I'm going to do next uh, and that's where the fear uh, begins to come from. But when you, when you find boredom kind of percolating up uh, into your brain, it's it's a good sign that um, that you're you know you've you've done all the easy work. You've sort of you've sort of expended the um, uh, the the obvious choices. And then and then the invitation of boredom is to look again. You know, rather than to kind of go, okay, there's nothing there's nothing more to do here. I got to go find something else to look again. You know, what else can be played? What are the other uh, the other opportunities that are presented by the uh, by the experience you find yourself in? Uh, and often, you know, that is. A kind of prerequisite uh, to finding meaning, you know. After you after you get through the, the the easy tasks of doing whatever it is that you do in your job over and over and over again, you know, then you can say, "Hmm, okay, how could I improve this? Or why am I even doing these things in the first place? Let me try to go find out. Or how could I make it better? Uh, or even like, okay, well, maybe I need to be some, doing something else entirely." All of those kinds of revelations. Um, Almost you re- almost require you first to face boredom, and then through boredom uh, to um, uh, to direct your attention to what might, might might overcome it, what might be possible in the face of that boredom. So let's 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 put these principles into action. We've we've kind of done it a bit. We've given some examples uh, throughout the conversation, but like let's take the airplane example, right? So you're bored. You've done all the 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 low hanging fruit. You've read. You played your games. But you're still on the plane. How do you play? Right. How do you approach the airplane with a playful mindset? Right, and you know the, the airplane is like uh, it, it's it's my my kryptonite almost. I find it so difficult, and so you know, as an example, it's 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 uh, an interesting exercise I think for all of us because you know what it means to be uh, to be on a plane is you know to face uh, the, the the sense of being uh, 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 crushed inside of your seat or to be next to someone that you maybe do or don't want to talk to, uh, or to or to uh, to ask what you know what what the magazine says that uh, uh, that you might read instead of uh, instead of pursuing some other activity all of those kinds of like little meaning seemingly meaningless activities right they're kind of what make flight what it is uh even like the the cramped bathroom with the you know with the the strange smell uh walking down the aisle uncomfortably and being and being uh uh, uh kind of tilted off your feet uh, by turbulence you know those kind of small experiences as they add up uh they produce this sort of sum total effect of of being on the plane now you know maybe this isn't something that you know you can kind of do over and over again or that you even find yourself in a situation where it matters but it's an exercise it's like an exercise you perform in order that you can do it later with anything else so um, I'll give you another example, uh, which is which comes from. I mean, many of the examples in the book, you know, just come from my own life. Because if the ex, if the if the if the premise I'm advancing is that you need to find a way for your ordinary life to be meaningful, then I, I better be able to look in my ordinary life uh, to find meaning. Uh, so one of the things one of the things that uh, that I've you know been facing in in my community is uh, I, a few years ago I got like kind of accidentally involved in in local local land use politics and this sounds like the most boring thing ever right like zoning and uh, and uh, all of the kind of regulations of zoning variances and how to change zoning and then uh, you know how to how to manage uh, up approvals for for new and old construction in a historic district and these sorts of activities um, I as I was thrust into them they just seemed like overwhelming ridiculous um, but as I got more and more involved uh, in in this process of sort of you know being a a, a citizen member of uh, of a community and, and and engaging with the the aspects of planning uh, the the development of the future of my uh, of my neighborhood and my and my city and my county and so forth I realized huh like there's there's this whole universe underneath where I wanted to stop 
you know? And the place I wanted to stop was, oh, somebody wants to build something I don't like or something, right? But in fact, you know, once you dig below that, you realize, hmm, there's actually a whole job, like there are urban planners and there's a whole universe of, of, of knowledge that you can, you could do your whole career around this. Um, like, who am I to kind of cast it aside and pretend uh, like there's nothing meaningful to, to, to be found there? And as I begin to understand the constraints and limitations, you know, legal, uh, dealing with, with individuals in the community, uh, uh, managing the time that's required to kind of meet with a, a builder or, or, or to, uh, uh, to figure out how to, how to, you know, get something done on the calendar of the, of the planning commission, all of these sorts of things, uh, those became the aspects of play. And, you know, it's, it takes, it takes a bit of squinting. It takes a bit of work before you can kind of see, um, these, these supposed nuisances, like, you know, like dealing with land use politics as, uh, as a game, like anything else. Right. And I, even like, I've, you know, I, I read the book just a few weeks ago, but like, even just like trying to like do, you know, squint and try to find those things. It's helped me, um, look at things that I otherwise would have think as thought of as a nuisance as like, that is an opportunity to like play with it. And it suddenly becomes not such a nuisance. It's actually kind of, it's kind of fun. It becomes an opportunity because what else were you going to be doing with your time? Uh, you know, uh, and every time I find myself faced with something that I, I where, where nuisance, like either, it, either it's either boredom or it's nuisance, where those are the sensations that, that kind of well up in me, um, then I just try to kind of stop and say, oh, okay, well, like, what more is there that I'm not seeing? You know, like my, my, uh, my, my sink, uh, my kitchen sink got uh, clogged a, a few weeks back, like pretty seriously clogged. Um, and you know I've become reasonably handy over my life, but uh, but this was this was really puzzling me. Uh, and so you know you can get annoyed. I, 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 instead of watching TV now, I have to clear the sink. But this is an opportunity to understand something else about how plumbing works. I can kind of kind of improve my uh, my competence in, uh, in in uh, in in DIY home maintenance, and 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 through doing so, also learn something more about how my particular sink is constructed. And maybe if it's not constructed properly, I could I could pursue the remedy of that either through my own hands. Uh, or, or by hiring my plumber, which you know then also requires you to find a plumber that you want to use. So, like all of those like little moments, um, even though they seem like just just like detritus, the things that we we don't want to think about, so we can get on to the good stuff. There's still meaning there too. It's just that you have to treat it as such, right? Um, and as you said earlier, um, this isn't a fatalistic approach. Like you're not just supposed to. You don't necessarily have to accept everything the way it is right there's sometimes you have to just like take the reality that or the ideal in your head and you actually have to make that a reality um because like the current reality is like is completely unacceptable yeah and you know play it doesn't mean accepting all of the conditions of a particular set of constraints forever like you know as if they were sort of sort of brought down from the mountain or dictated uh by by fate play can also involve applying new conditions, new constraints, new limitations or, or, or disposing of old ones. And, and this is like minor or major matters. You know, the kind of play that involves remedying the leaky faucet that I just mentioned. It's not like, well, you know, this is my life. My, 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 uh, you know, my, uh, my, my, my sink's going to leak and my, and it's going to be clogged and that's all I can do. You know, no, I have to, I have to involve something else. I have to introduce new concepts and new materials into the playground that is my, my sink. Uh, and the same is true of, of much weightier, you know, matters. Uh, if you think about, you know, like social conditions or, or injustices and that you want to remedy because the, you know, the, the, the limitations of living in a world of, 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 of racial violence, for example, are unacceptable, you know, then it's not that you say, well, that's it. You know, there's nothing I could do about it. It's that you, you have to muster kind of a different imaginary circle, different playground around those elements of the world and then say, well, how could we manipulate them differently to produce a different outcome? Right. So you create a new playground. To what you're doing. Yeah, but but you know, like to make that change in the first place, to make that new playground, you first start by acknowledging the reality that you want to change. You have to treat it for what it is, and part of that part of that process is accepting and understanding the circumstances rather than denying them. Awesome. Well, Ian, this has been a great conversation. Where can people learn more about your book? Yeah, so uh, you know, the, the book's available at your favorite bookseller, and you can also check out my website at bogost.com, B-O-G-O-S-T.com. There's information about the book and links to other conversations and articles I've written that are on the same theme. All right, Ian Bogost, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. My guest today is Ian Bogos. He's the author of the book, Play Anything. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can also find more information about Ian's work at bogos.com. And also check out the show notes at aom.is slash bogost for links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.